Good afternoon, everyone joining us. It feels like a month that you've been here, Cliff. I don't know how long it's been, but we do have Cliff Pickett back with us. He's still out venturing all around the, the Wild West. He is in Colorado right now. Today, we're talking about the speed of Lightroom, so getting more more out of the program. And, and a lot of times, people get that lag, they program runs slow and you are going to tell us why it is not the program and it's probably the user right no offense but yeah it, it's, it's going <laughs> to be you um but that's what we're here for so we don't have a lot of time you only have about an hour and so i yes, do want to dive in but i will say also before we do we've done a lot of these for those that are just tuning in that fortunately or unfortunately are not familiar with me we've done a whole series of Lightroom, like from beginning, from import to calling to post processing to sharing, all of that. So send me an email. It's gonna be on BNH's page too. I have a list of all the links I can send it to you guys. So I'm gonna to touch on a few different things, but really what as we were going through this for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time, we I didn't I got a lot of emails from a lot of people asking specific questions and a lot of it had to do with speeding up Lightroom. And I kind of touched upon it in several of the classes, but we I didn't really have a chance to do a singular class just on how to speed things up. And even this is gonna be a smaller part of a bigger picture. Uh, I spoke about the boot camp that I'm doing uh, and I'll be talking about it again, but the first week of September is like 14 hours of training on this. So don't freak out. I want you guys to ask me questions. I want you guys to reach out to me personally. I'm happy to answer anything, but know that there's a lot of ground to cover and I set aside time to do that during my boot camp. So that'll be the first week of September. But this, I want to stay singularly focused just on how to speed things up. And let's just get right into it, because I'll, I'll give you kind of a background and uh, a diagram of how my mind works. Sorry. I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, so this is a mind map that I built. just kind of helps me keep on point. And really what it comes down to is when you, when you want to speed Lightroom up, and I'm, I'm, this is such an important topic. It really is. And I'm glad we have the opportunity to talk about it today because our time is precious, right? We're learning that now more than ever. But the reason why we have computers is not to waste their time, it's to save us time. And if you're like me, especially when I started, I'm sure everyone's raising their hand right now, the computers are just really, really frustrating. And we find ourselves just staring at the screen, loading or PC load letter, whatever that means, right? So what I wanna do is show you from a hardware standpoint, how to get the best gear. If only there was you know, a store in New York City where we can buy all this stuff from. And then from the software standpoint, how to set all this up. What preferences do we need? What settings do we need? And then just the smarts, right? The wisdom, the knowledge. And I'll be getting into that because a lot of it is just the decisions that we make. How do we speed things up um, from the choices that we make about how we approach it from a workflow perspective, right? So those are kind of like the three overall topics. Um, so let's get started. Let's get into hardware here. And by the way, don't worry about writing this down. You guys are, you know, Take a notes, don't worry about it. Um, shoot me an email, cliff at cliffordpicket.com. I'll send you a link for this. Um, it's all dynamically linked, so I can share it with anyone. It's not an issue. Um, all right, so let's get started. Restart Lightroom. This might be like the biggest savior, right? I do lessons with students all over the world. And <laughs> probably about a quarter of them I could just answer with just restart Lightroom and see if that works. And you'd be surprised a lot of the problems that you have. Uh, restart Lightroom, right? Don't sit there and struggle with it, just restart it. But to go a step further, restart your computer too, right? I'm not trying to be facetious here. I really do mean it. Restarting your computer is a lot like you going to sleep at night. We have a temporary memory and that gets restored and refreshed if we restart the computer. So before you sit down and really edit and work on your photos, take the time, take a few minutes, restart the entire computer. That might be the single most important thing you can do to speed up the entire thing. Right, so just keep that in mind, restart the computer ahead of time. Now, from a hardware standpoint too, uh, I get a lot of questions, especially recently, right? Everyone's stuck at home, everyone's trying to buy new computers and faster processors. What do I need, right? It, maybe it, the answer isn't always just throwing money at the problem, but the hardware does make a big difference. This is a hardware-based uh, endeavor, <laughs> photography. Like it or not, it is, right? So a processor is really important. Now. 64-bit processor, I just put this in here. These are for the Windows people. For Apple, we've been having 64-bit OS for a while, an operating system. Some of the older Windows, I believe now the new Windows systems um, require 64-bit, but Lightroom is always operating at 64-bit. So if you're not, if you have an older Windows machine, 
you might want to look into that. And if I click on this little arrow here, this is a link to directly to Adobe. Again, if you guys have questions, shoot me an email. Um, I'll send you all this. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I feel like this is important, right? I'm not here to give you a fish. I'm, I'm, I'm here to teach you how to fish, right? So I want to give you the knowledge, not just throwing it at you, but also giving you the, the resources to find more information as well. So this is a link to the performance page directly on Adobe's website. And this is what their recommendations are. So a lot of this isn't just me making it up or word of mouth. This is coming directly from Adobe. So here you have the minimum system requirements, right? This is a 64-bit operating system I was talking about. Uh, a big question I get from people who are looking to get new systems all the time, how much RAM do I need? So right here, Lightroom's gonna say 12 gigs of RAM minimum. I'd recommend 16 gigs. You don't wanna get eight gigs. You can still buy Apple computers and other computers that have eight gigs. That's more for working at home for office execs, stuff like that. You wanna use 16 gigs minimum. 32 gigs is more than you're gonna need right now. You don't have to worry about it. Unless you're shooting video, that is helpful for video, getting 32 or 64. 16 is sort of the sweet spot between price and, um, and speed. Uh, fast hard disks, right? So that brings us back to here, our hard disks, our hard drives, fast hard disks. I haven't even heard that said like that before. Hard drives, this is actually a really big bottleneck for a lot of people, right? We go out and buy a really large drive, right? Maybe 10 terabytes or 16 terabytes. There's some great drives out there, but that is gonna slow you down. And it's really important to understand where the bottlenecks are. Because in Lightroom, we have our, we have our data essentially in two places. We have our catalog, which is where it's a, basically a database of all of our edits, where our previews or the location where our previews are stored. But basically all of our edits, all of our stars, all of our rating, all of our keywords, it's just a glorified spreadsheet. That is critical to the whole process. Our images, believe it or not, are not as critical where we store them because we're using previews instead of original files. Right? And I'll speak to that in a little bit. Um, so our hard drives, it's important that we have a, a wide array of hard drives. So when we talk about hard drive speed, there's basically three, basically three types of hard drives. We have our external drive, which are the larger drives. That's where we store most of our images. Then we have our internal drives. And the internal drives are much faster, but we typically don't have a lot of space. So if you're like me, you're absolutely gonna run out of space on your internal drive really quickly if you haven't already, right? And then there's something called an SSD, which is a solid state disk. And that is typically much faster than an external drive and typically not as fast as your internal drive, assuming that your internal drives are SSDs. Most new computers, your internal drives are, are, are SSDs, solid state disks. So let me, uh, let me bring something up for a second here. I'm gonna go to my desktop. And I tried doing this live, but for whatever reason, it never works using Zoom. So I just took some screenshots. This is an app called um, speedtest.net. And this is for just a Seagate five terabyte drive, the ones that I recommend, the external drives. So the, the smallest, highest capacity, lightest drives you can buy. Uh, and I'll give you guys a link in, in b and in a few minutes to this. Uh, all right, so this is about 50 megabytes. Not that fast, but you notice it has a lot of capacity. So this is a great solution if you're just looking to store your images. So 50 megabytes, I'm looking at the right speed here, 50, 40. Then we go to our SSD. It's about 10 times faster, right? So from a hard drive perspective, from a hardware perspective, you can increase, you have orders of magnitude and increase in speed when you change your hard drive from a spinning disk, an external drive, to, a, to an external SSD, a solid state disk. Now, if we go to our internal drive, we're getting almost an order of magnitude more as well. We're going from 50 to 500 to almost 3,000 megabytes per second. This is critical. What this means is if you're frustrated because Lightroom isn't generating your, your images or you're waiting for things and things just feel really sluggish, it's most likely not the operating, it's most likely not the software, it's most likely not Lightroom. It's the computer trying to access the data. Think about it, we're taking pictures now that are 40, 50, 60 megapixel files, right? They're enormous data, and we're trying to breeze through them really fast, and we're trying to process them. Having a drive that can access that speed and deliver that kind of content is critical. 
right? So these are the three types of drives. And if I bring you to my website here, uh, under resources, just cliffordpicket.com, or I could just Google my name, you'll find it. Go to resources, you'll find about the gear I use. At the top, I have these three, or these two hard drives. This is the slower drive, but it's a larger capacity. It's a great place to store your images. And then down here, this is a newer model. It used to be the T5, now it's the T7. Uh, this little thing's for fingerprint, so you can encrypt it if you want to as well. So about 10 times faster than the drive above. All right, so that's from a hardware perspective, just hard drives. One last thing I'll mention about that as well is the connection itself, right? We have USB 2, USB 3, USB 3. There's a whole lot of, you know, acronyms going on there. Just know that USB 3 or USB C is what you want. It's significantly faster than the older USB 2. To confuse it more, the USB 3 plugs will fit into USB 2 ports. So you do want to be careful. You want to make sure you have the right cable, USB 3 or Thunderbolt or USB C cable. Right? And do that, you know, do that research depending on what drive you have. Make sure you're not connected via USB 2.0. And that could be as simple as getting a hub. And you're like, oh well, I have all these drives. I spent all this money on these drives. I have them all plugged into this hub, but the hub is now the bottleneck because it's USB 2.0. Right, it's like getting a Ferrari and trying to drive it down the FDR. What's the point, right? There's a 20 mile per hour. I don't even know if anyone knows the speed limit in New York City, <laughs> but getting a Ferrari in New York City just doesn't make sense. It's a big bottleneck, right? So make sure you do have the right cable and you're using the right ports as well. So that's from a hardware standpoint. There, not too much of this is based on hardware, believe it or not, but those specs do make a difference. All right, let's go back to my brain. Processor we talked about, hard drives we talked about, um, hard drives themselves. So we talked about the type of hard drives. Now, as far as the spinning disk drives too, um, I have a little note here. There are multiple types of spinning disk drives or slower drives, right? You wanna look for a fast 7,200 RPM drive. That's gonna be important. Some of the cheaper drives are gonna be slower than that. And all that means is the rotations are slower. What that means is like trying to ask someone in a library for a book and you have a guy with a broken leg trying to find a book for you, right? Rather than someone who is just like right out of school and can whip around and try and find that book, you want something that can that has a faster RPM drive. It will be a little bit faster. Not fast, faster. Um, hard drive space is actually another important one here. I just kept some notes. Uh, basically, you don't want to use more than 80% of your drive. And that's something a lot of people don't really consider or may have heard, but it does make a big difference. So even if you're running on your internal drive and you're starting to fill up your space, you only have about five, 10, 15% of space left, it's going to drastically slow down the performance of that drive, drastically. And you can test that with speedtest.net. You can, you can get two drives, the exact same capacity, same model, and one's full and one's empty, it will be a big difference. And so I try to fill your backpack with a whole bunch of water bottles and go hiking, right? It's gonna slow you down. The more information, the more stuff you have on that drive, it will slow you down. So just keep that in mind. Um, try not to use more than 80% of the capacity of your drive, no matter what drive it is. Uh, the type of connection we talked about. And then using smart previews to edit. Um, the reason why I put this under hard drives, this is gonna show up again when I talk about previews. The reason why I talk about this under hard drives is because you'll notice that these hard drives that I'm recommending are slower, the higher capacity drives. But our previews, what we actually work off in Lightroom, don't get stored on that slower drive. They get stored with your catalog. So that's gonna go under smarts. And we'll get to that in a few minutes, where we put this stuff. But for now, your hard drives, this is the hardware that you're gonna look for. These are the specs that you're looking for. Okay, so that covers the hardware part. Let's talk about software for a second. And let's get into the operating system. So very briefly, make sure you, op you update your operating system or don't, right? And the reason why I mention that is there's a little bit of a, a controversy or controversy, as some people say. If you update, typically, if you're using a new machine, you want to update the operating system. And you want to update the software as well in Lightroom. The last release, I did a whole class uh, about a month ago, I'd say, uh, on just the updates uh, on what Lightroom released, uh, or Adobe released for the latest the version of Lightroom. And it significantly increased performance, especially in the develop module. So you want to update the software, but updating the operating system seems like a no-brainer. And for most people, it is. If you have a new computer in the last three, four, or five years, maybe even longer, 
If you have an older computer though, you will notice that if you update the operating system, even if you're allowed to, it may slow down the computer because the operating systems are designed to take advantage of the better capacity machines, the better spec machines, right? And what happens is it will overheat your machine and your machine will intentionally slow down. So just keep that in mind. If you have a newer machine, I would suggest upgrading an operating system. I did want to mention that because it doesn't, it's not necessarily the case for everybody. Anyone with an iPhone will, will, <laughs> will know that very well, right? If you have a phone more than a few years old, you update the operating system. Everything starts running a little bit slower. And there is a very good reason why. They're not just trying to get your money to buy a new one. It's because it's designed to take advantage of the new hardware and it will overheat. So it intentionally will slow it down. All right, software, right? So this is, this is kind of the meat and the potatoes of this. Now the operating system, the performance, the GPU, this is relatively new. And I'm gonna get into the settings in a little bit too. But the performance of the GPU, the camera raw cache, these are maybe the two most important adjustments we can make. So let's jump into Lightroom for a second here. And I'm gonna to go to my preferences, just Lightroom Classic preferences. Uh, on a Windows machine, I believe it's under File or Edit. Slightly different place for Macs. And this will jump you over to General, but I'm just gonna go into Performance. All right, this is under Preferences, this is the most important one. And up here where it says use graphics processor, where it says auto, for most of you, you can keep it on auto. But for some of you, you might want to turn this on or off. So GPU is basically a graphics processing unit. What it does is allow Lightroom to leverage a separate chip in your computer that's just meant for graphics processing. And if you do that, it's going to take that task off of the CPU and off of the internal processing and designate just that GPU to speed things up tremendously. You may notice that there might be a slowdown now. So there's definitely a caveat here. Adobe can't design this for every single computer using every single different version of GPU, old, new, different manufacturers. So this is another scenario where I would keep it on auto, but if your computer is running really slow or you feel like Lightroom is running really very slow, you might want to turn this off and see if it improves. For some of you that have a GPU that's not compatible or just not as compatible, it actually might speed things up a little bit. So try that. I can't really tell you whether on or off is going to be the best for you. For most of you, keeping this on or keeping it on auto is going to give you the best results. Uh, the next one, the cache. This is actually really important too. Um, by default, it's something extremely small. It's like three or five gigs or something like that. So what the cache is, is temporary memory. And it's like if I asked you to remember a phone number, you could, you could fire it off immediately. But if I can get back a week from now, I said, hey, do you have that phone number still? Sort of like the notes that many of you might be taking right now. And you say, yeah, yeah, I, I have it somewhere. Let me check. Is it under my contacts? And I put it in the storage. I stick it in my wallet. It's going to take you a lot longer to figure out where it is. Same thing happens with your cache, right? So your temporary memory, essentially any adjustments, anything that you've done, any that when it renders a preview for your photos rather than the original resolution picture, it stores it in this super fast temporary memory. So what you want to do is increase this between 30 to 50 gigs. What I typically tell people is roughly about the size of a shoot. Right, so if you're gonna sit down, and you're gonna edit, you're gonna call through an event that you shot or a day or a trip that you've, that you've photographed. You're gonna sit down and work on this group of images, whatever roughly that the, the size of that group is in gigs, that's what you should have in your temporary memory. All right, so that's gonna be different for a lot of people. Typically between 30 and 50 gigs is fine. Now, where do you put this? It's just as important. Remember I showed you those three different types of drives, your external, your SSD, and then your internal. If you have enough room on your internal drive, like I do here, I'd recommend putting this on your internal drive. For most of you, that's gonna be your fastest drive. If you start running out of space, you can either make this a little bit smaller or put it on that external SSD drive. Whatever you do, you don't wanna put this on that spinning disk drive, that 10 or 20 you know, high capacity, 10 or 20 terabyte drive. You don't wanna put it there. That may be a reason why, that may be a bottleneck for a lot of you. All right, so just keep that in mind. Keep that in your internal drive if you can. You want to put this on your fastest drive. All right, video cache, don't worry about it. You don't want to use Lightroom for video for the most part anyway. Uh, enable hover room previews. This is actually another important preference too. So Lightroom has, let me bring you over to this image for a second. If I hit D for to develop, and I go into previews here. This is all previews I've done for this uh, I have a master class in iPhone photography being released shortly. We filmed in Italy before COVID hit. 
Um, but you'll notice that if I hover over these, now this might be a little bit slow, but it's giving you a live preview, a full screen preview on hover. Right, now think about what it's doing there. It needs to generate previews for every single preset that you have. So keep that in mind. You might wanna turn this off and that's what this option here in preferences will do. Enable hover preview of presets in loop view. If you have a lot of presets, you might wanna consider turning that off. That will speed up Lightroom a little bit. It needs to generate previews for every single preset. So keep that in mind. If you don't have that many previews, don't worry about it. Uh, other preferences here while we're at it. Is there anything under, under performance? Generate previews in parallel. We're not gonna cover that. That's not a big deal. That just creates previews in the background for us. Uh, under general, here's where you can see where your catalog is being stored. For a lot of you, this isn't really under uh, speeding up Lightroom, but it's just good to know. Instead of saying load most recent catalog, choose the catalog that you're using. Right? I have a whole class on doing just this, creating one catalog, one master location, one master catalog for everything. It's very critical. Um, go back and watch that, please. Uh, that may speed things up considerably too, just from a perspective of looking for things. Having one database is really important at your fingertips. Okay, everything else should be pretty much fine under preferences. So it's just that performance, that's the big one. Let's go back to my mind map here. Um, full screen or full screen and loop view. So what I mean by this is, now a lot of you guys, when you're looking at your images, right? This is a panel I shot yesterday at uh, up here in Silverton. This is one of the highest roads up here. Uh, absolutely stunning. A lot of you might see this loading up here, right? So there's a shortcut, which you may or may not know about F for full screen. And if I press that, it's gonna make my image full screen. And most of you may think, cause this is how I call my images, by the way, I wanna see my entire photo. I wanna see it as large as possible. And then I can go to the, I can hit the right arrow key and I could cycle between my images. Now you might not, you will not be able to see wrong, but I'm, I'm hitting this key really fast. You can almost hear it if I put the microphone. Right, but you'll notice it's not responding very fast. The full screen preview, don't use it. It just slows you down. I don't know why exactly, but it's not designed to be really fast. It's just not. The faster way to do this is, you see these tabs on the left and right hand side? Instead of making it full screen, we're gonna do a faux full screen. So I'm gonna hit this tab key, and all it's gonna do is get rid of these tabs on left and right. If I hold shift tab, it's gonna get rid of all the tabs. So now I have a simulated full screen, not a true full screen, but as large as I possibly can, getting rid of all the other clutter. Now when I cycle through it, it's gonna be a bit faster. All right, so just keep that in mind. Don't use that full screen. It's a small thing, but these are little tips that really add up. All right, turn off auto save on XMP. This is a little bit controversial as well, and I don't even know why, it's just a terrible idea. Right. There are things that are subjective, and, I, and I'll just say, like, this is up to you. Some people might recommend doing it this way. Some people recommend doing this this way. Saving changes. So what this really means is when I make an adjustment to this file, let's, let's say I make, uh, I make this a black and white. I never actually touch this file, but I go into this a lot in some of the previous classes. I go into this a lot in the boot camp I'm doing next month. I'm never touching the original picture. This is just a preview of the picture. Right? Think about it. This is why Lightroom is so fast is I don't need a 64 megapixel image. I just need a two megapixel image, a preview, right? just about the resolution of my screen. So I'm never touching the original resolution. Now, that means that all these adjustments though are not with the file. They're not with the picture. All these adjustments are in the catalog. That's why it's so critical to have that catalog on the fastest drive. Now, these adjustments though, all of them, they're saved in the catalog too. So it's critical to have these backed up. There's a couple of ways to do it, but why I mentioned the save adjustments to XMP, if I go up to preferences, actually catalog settings, and I go under metadata here, you'll have this option to automatically write changes into XMP. This should be off by default, and I'd recommend keeping it off. What this means is every time I make an adjustment, I make something brighter, I make something warmer, I make something black and white, it saves, it saves, it saves, it saves, it saves. Every single adjustment. Imagine how much that's gonna slow you down. There are instructors that will tell you, yeah, but it's safe. 
right? That if you what happens if your catalog gets corrupted, all of your adjustments are saved out to file. Sure. But do you need to save it every single time you make an adjustment? That's going to significantly slow you down, especially if your files are on a slower drive already. You saw those read and write speeds, right? So just keep that in mind. Keep this off. What you can do is when you're done, you select all the images that you added, Command A. I'll just select this range for now. All right, this, and you can hit Command A for all the images you want and Command S. What that will do is just trigger to save when you're done. Save that metadata out to the file. All right, let's move on, but that's important. Just don't, don't keep that on. Uh, she, Photoshop's RAM settings, um, I'll briefly just mention that. Basically, don't keep Photoshop open. <laughs> that's the bottom line. Photoshop is a resources hog. And anyone who's using Lightroom, especially this Lightroom Classic, it comes bundled with Photoshop. And you absolutely should be using Photoshop when and where it's needed. I've, the whole bootcamp talks about why the majority, up to 90% of all of your editing, can and should be done in Lightroom. Not just because it's easier and it's cleaner, it's more efficient, because it's actually better quality. And I go into exactly why. I don't have time to go into it today. But if you, if you use Photoshop, and you should use it for that 10%, you don't want to leave it open. It's absolutely critical that you shut that down when you're done. I have a whole process that shows you why and how to do that in the fastest way possible. But for the most part, just make sure Photoshop clicks. It'll take up about 90% of your resources on your computer if you leave it open. So that's kind of critical. Uh, update Lightroom, we talked about that. Uh, optimize catalog. So let's go back to our catalog settings here. Now I mentioned where we put our catalog is important. Right, so this is actually where you can find out where your catalog is. For most of you, the default location will be your pictures folder and your internal drive, and that's exactly where I'd recommend you putting it. So your catalog location for me is on my internal drive as well, in my pictures folder. Right, and you can click show, and it'll show you exactly where that is. You can move it around. So if it's on your external drive, your slower drive, you can click show, quit Lightroom, and then you can drag it. You can move it over to a faster drive, either that SSD or your internal drive, and then launch Lightroom from that location. Uh, you'll also have the option here, back up every time Lightroom quits, right? This is important. Don't do once a month or once a week. Back it up. Again, this is another reason why you don't need to save the XMP. Uh, auto save every single time. Now, file handling. This is another one. If you have a slower machine, if you have an older machine, you might want to consider changing the previews to medium instead of high. That's going to generate a slightly lower resolution file that's going to load faster. You can also change the standard preview size to whatever you want. I typically recommend keeping it on auto. So look at the screen size that you're using and give you something that's either exactly the same or slightly larger. You can do this manually as well. Um, you, don't, you don't want and you don't need a larger preview than the resolution of your monitor. Right? But you may also notice that those who are using, let's say, 5K IMAX, there is a known issue with Lightroom being a little bit slower because it does have to render higher resolution previews. So if it's a real problem for you, after doing everything else I show you, you might want to consider changing the resolution as well as the quality here. Now, one-to-one -one previews. We didn't talk about that yet. Uh, one-to-one previews, what a preview is, basically it's like the cover of a book, right? You have a 64 megapixel file if you're shooting with those new Sonys. We don't need 64 megapixels to display it. So it just displays this two megapixel file or just whatever the resolution of your monitor is, right? I'm on a laptop right now. so. It's actually a relatively small file. It will breeze through this pretty fast. If you're zooming in and, out, in and out all the time, if you're shooting portraits, if you're shooting headshots, if you're shooting people or anything where there's critical focus, and you see that loading pop up, loading, loading, loading as you're zooming in, that's your one-to-one -one previews. So Lightroom by default is only going to render your previews, which are about the size of your screen. If you want to zoom into someone's eye to see if that's in focus, now it needs to render a one-to-one -one preview. So you have the option to render that on the fly or you have the option to render that ahead of time. And where that comes in is in your import dialog box. When you put the memory card in, or I click that word input on the bottom left. You're going to see this. I, my face might be covering this. I don't know. You can let me know, Derek. Um, I can either, you can minimize that or, but it's on this right hand side here under at the very top, build previews. For most of you, I recommend doing standard. But if you're one of those people that do zoom in and out all the time, just to check your pictures, not to edit, just to check your files, then I'd recommend building one-to-one -one previews. What that's gonna do, it will slow the import process down because it's building those previews ahead of time. 
But the whole point of this is to make the computer work for you. So it'll slow the import process down a little bit. It will do this in the background. But when you're ready to sit down and work, you can zoom in and out all day long. You don't have to worry about whether it's building it on the fly. That's what that loading symbol is. But for a lot of you, this is going to be really important. Build those one-on-one -on -one previews. Now, you can build those on the fly. So let's say, sure, but what if I forgot to do it? Now, I'm going to sit down and work on a shoot that I did yesterday or, or a week. I can select that folder, select all the images I'm going to work on on that folder, and go to Library, go to Previews. And here, I'm going to leave that up so you guys can really see this. You can build one-to-one -one previews on the fly, and you can delete them on the fly. Right? In that last settings dialog, you saw that option to delete them after 30 days. Right? And that's actually not a bad option because you can always render them again. If you start running out of space, you can delete one-to-one -one previews, not on an individual basis. You can, but you can do it on a, on, a, on a weekly, a monthly, a yearly basis, or in your entire catalog. Or you can just delete the previews file entirely. It's not going to hurt Lightroom at all. Just make sure it's closed. All right, so you can render these as much as you want and delete them as much as you want to. This is going to greatly speed things up for a lot of people too. And if you're working on an older folder that's a few months old, select all the images before you start editing and culling and say build standard size previews too. And it will build those into the cache, into that temporary memory and make everything run a little bit faster. Okay, where are we? About halfway through, good. Optimize catalog. So when you quit Lightroom, um, that's typically when I recommend optimizing your catalog. You'll see the option to back up. And there is an option to optimize the catalog at any point as well. Uh, I typically don't do that. I'll typically optimize the catalog after I'm done working on it. So I don't want to quit Lightroom right now, but you will see the options. It'll say, it'll give the option to either back up or give the option to optimize the catalog. What that's going to do is basically, what's the word on a Windows computer? Uh, defragment, right? We don't have those Macs anymore. But when you move files around and you edit and change things, there's little pockets, little gaps that you don't need anymore of irrelevant information. And when you want to, you can optimize that at any time. So typically I'll do that when I'm done, which makes the most sense. I'm not sitting there waiting for my catalog to be optimized. And I'll do that every single time when I'm finished and when I'll back up Lightroom. And by the way, when you back up Lightroom, there's another class on that. Back it up to a different drive for me, please. Or back it up to the same drive, but keep that backup in a cloud. Right? Otherwise, there's no point in backing up your catalog if you're going to put it on the same drive and it's not being backed up to the cloud immediately. Right? If something crashes, you're going to lose not just your photos or not your photos, but you lose all the adjustments. And that's just as critical if you spend a lot of time on this. All right, convert to DNG. Um, the fastest way to do anything is simply not to do it. And that's the advice I'd give you when you import. I get a lot of those questions too. Do I convert to DNG? What do you recommend? I'm typically going to recommend not doing that as well. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. Let's take a picture here. Because this import dialog box is going to be really critical to giving you a foundation to speed everything else up. I'll put my memory card reader in. Now, everything in Lightroom is automatic, right? And everything I'm going to show you, everything I show my boot camp and all my students, I found a way to leverage every single aspect of Lightroom to make it as fast as possible. And by that, I mean to let it do all the work. The least amount of work possible is the, is the best workflow possible. Right? So we don't even have to open up Lightroom. This will automatically open up the second I put the memory card in. I go over this whole workflow in detail. Uh, it's going to find all the existing pictures on my memory card. Right? I don't delete anything. I don't format my card until it's backed up multiple places, not for months at a time. So it's only going to find the new pictures here. And then at the top, you may or not, may not be able to see this depending on um, your screen. But at the top, you'll have copy as DNG or copy. I just choose copy. Right? The, the argument was copy is DNG. You can format it so that, let's say, Nikon goes out of business. Well, what happens to that proprietary format, right? that RAW file, that NEF, or Canon, the CR2s, or Sony, the ARWs? Those are all proprietary formats. So Adobe says, well, we're going to be here forever. And even if we're not, we're going to make this an open source format. That's what the DNG, a digital negative file. So that imagine trying to play a cassette tape now, right? or a, 
or eight tracks or something. But that's more of a hardware thing. That argument doesn't fly in the digital field as much. We can convert it at any time. There's actually a free DNG converter you can buy to do this after the fact. So it's not an issue. But there is a small argument to be made about copying as DNG. It gives you a slightly smaller file size. And it builds in those XMPs, those, that sidecar file, all those edits into a wrapper that doesn't exist in the proprietary format because Adobe can't touch the proprietary format of Canon and Icon. So there's a small you know, argument to be made there. Honestly, I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. It's not necessary to do this. You're also losing some proprietary information there as well. So I just keep it as copy. I wouldn't worry about the copy as DNG. It's just unnecessary. All right, so that's preferences. Other settings. Pause, address, and face lookup. So this is something that kind of sneaks under the radar with a lot of people. And like, why is my computer running slow? So if you're shooting on your phone or you have a, a GPS-enabled camera, which most of us don't in 2020, which is crazy to me, right? If you have GPS-enabled information or GPS, uh, an iPhone or an Android phone, something like that, Lightroom is going to detect the latitude and longitude. That's what the GPS gives you. And reverse engineer what the address was for that latitude and longitude for those coordinates. Right? And it's actually really helpful to have that. But it's going to do that for every single file that you import. So what you can do, and the other thing it's going to do is, is recognize faces. So let me bring back this tab here. And under where it says your name, or it might say Lightroom, if it said my name, that might be a little weird, but I'm cool with that. Uh, address and face detection here. You want to make sure that this is paused. Right? You're going to need to do this. If you don't have this on already, you might want to pause it. This is going to make Lightroom run a bit faster as well, especially if you have a larger database where you haven't done face detection yet. Face detection is absolutely brilliant, and it's one of the ways that we can speed the entire keywording process. I have a whole class I've done on that, and I cover that quite a bit in the boot camp next month as well. Uh, but for now, turning these off, at least while you don't need them, and then you can turn them back on when you're done working, right? Leave your laptop on, leave your computer on, let Lightroom run, let it detect all those faces because it's actually really, really helpful to have that. It will save you a whole lot of time than going to your images one by one and keywording everyone. That would be a nightmare. I spent a lot of my morning working with a student privately that had, I think, three or 400,000 images, and he and all family photos for the most part. And he was trying to do this folder by folder, in my image by image. It just wasn't working. So I showed him how to do the entire database and just keyword and find all the faces. And then click on one face, find similar, and it will show you every other similar face. And you can batch hundreds at the same time. It's really helpful, but it does take up a lot of CPU and GPU. So pause those. It's going to make a big difference. All right. Pause backways and other cloud solutions. If you're using Google Drive, if you're using Dropbox like I am, um, Microsoft, OneDrive, all those do take up system resources as well. You might want to consider pausing those as you're going to sit down and work to optimize your entire system. Uh, pause sync with Lightroom while editing as well. So a lot of you that may not know this, there isn't a, a, a cloud component to Adobe. And it's changed on the new system. So for those of you who haven't updated, it would be under your name or Lightroom over here. For those of you who have updated, you're going to see this little cloud icon on the top right. You click that, and here's going to show you all the cloud computing, what's going on, right? what's syncing, what's not syncing. Uh, you can pause syncing here, and that will speed up the performance of Lightroom as well. Just remember to turn that back on when you're done. That's critical. That's how I, I have a whole workflow around basically leaving your computer at home, being able to go anywhere you want to, and just using your phone or your iPad or something like that to use Adobe's cloud to create a seamless wireless workflow. You never have to use your computer again to import your photos. It doesn't wirelessly from wherever you are. Um, it's really important to, to know how this cloud works, but pause it if your computer is running slow. Right, this is just about optimizing. I have to stay on track because there's so much to cover. All right, so we covered the hardware perspective. I'll leave that open for you guys too. We covered the software. We have about, what, 15, 20 minutes left? Good. So let's also cover just the smarts, right? What are the things that we can do to make things run fast? There's nothing to do with the hardware. There's nothing drives that we have to write. We, we covered all of that. What are just different workflow approaches that we can do to, to greatly speed things up? So first of all, just from a speed perspective, 
if you're looking for how to do something, whether that's, let's say we were saving the metadata out to file, right? If you're looking for something, knowing the shortcut's gonna be really helpful. Now for anything on the menu here, I don't expect you guys to memorize all of it, but anything that you do, you only wanna do once. That's a big part of the, the ultimate workflow that I teach, like the bootcamp that I give. Anything you do, you only wanna do once. That's how we leverage the database management of Lightroom. We never need to do things more than once. So if you find yourself enabling filters or finding something, right? Command F is a good one. Uh, or if you want to save metadata out to file, whatever it is that you want to do, it's going to, Lightroom's going to show you the shortcut for whatever it is the task that you want. Just commit that to memory if you can. Now, if you can't, right? Everywhere where Lightroom, where you're going to use Lightroom, it's going to show you the shortcut for how to do that very thing that you want to do. If you can't remember, you can go over to help here and just type in what you're looking for. Right? This falls under speed because it's saving you a lot of time rather than looking for something. And if you hover over it, so this is gonna tell you that it's possible. It's gonna tell you where that is. So if I wanna save metadata out to file, this is the menu system where it goes, but pay attention to the right-hand side, it's gonna tell you where the shortcut is to. Right? That's really important. So if you don't know how to do something, come up over the help menu, type what you're looking for, and it's a dynamic linkable search meaning that it'll tell you exactly where it is and it'll tell you the shortcut too. So you don't want to do anything more than once. That's a drastic speed improvement right there. Shortcuts. Speaking of shortcuts, there's actually a shortcut for shortcuts. Right? That's how much Lightroom really thought about this. Now, if you had to design a shortcut for shortcuts, what key do you think that would be? I can't see your hands, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer it. It's the question mark, but it's the command question mark. Right? Or control on a, on, a, on a Windows, on a PC. Now, you notice it says library shortcuts here. If I go to my develop module, and by the way, there's no X. This is kind of weird. You have to click to make it go away. If I go to develop module, another little shortcut, and a little trick pro tip here, shift command R will just reset the image no matter where you are. Um, if I hit command question mark now, it says develop shortcuts. All right, so you have shortcuts that are module specific. From a speed perspective as well, um, I took the time to save you guys even more time. I created this, the Lightroom Cliff Notes. And I have all those shortcuts at the bottom there, plus a whole bunch of other tips. Um, the culling, the sorting, just like I'm a very visual learner. I'm, I'm assuming that you guys are too. And so for me, it's helpful to have just one space that shows an overview of the entire approach to the, to the ultimate workflow that I created. This is just a small part of it, but all of these shortcuts are on the bottom here as well. If you guys want this, just shoot me an email, cliff at cliffordpicket.com. I'll, I'll send this out with a whole bunch of other stuff. So don't worry about taking a screen capture, writing that down. I'll just send you the file. Um, but having these shortcuts available to you, anything you do once, you only have to do once. Just commit that, commit to that, and then you'll find a way to drastically speed things up. There's nothing to do with the hardware or the software. This is just your approach. Uh, all right, let's go back to... What else do we have here? Um, shortcuts, importing and culling. So we briefly went over the importing and culling from a previous perspective. Now let's go back to the other things that we can do in import and cull. So we want to color images in the library develop module instead of the develop module. What do I mean by that? I briefly talked about that, but I actually had a client reach out today and said, it's so incredibly so, what am I doing wrong? And you notice how fast I can breeze through these images now. Right. If I go to my develop module, hit D to my develop module, what Lightroom's doing is creating a much higher resolution, uh, a, a more accurate representation in the develop module because that's where you're going to post-process the image. If you're trying to cull and sort through your pictures in the develop module, they look very similar because right? I don't have the tabs open. Now I have the tabs open so you can see. They look very similar, but they're, they're very different. It's a lot slower to try and breeze through and sort and cull through your images in the develop module. So make sure you're, you're in the library of that module. The shortcut is just E for enlarge, or really for loop, the old school loop with the E on the back. Or you can just go to your grid, G for grid, and double click. Just make sure you're calling and sorting through your images inside the library module, not the develop module. Uh, full screen we talked about uh, previews. So the type of previews we kind of briefly went over. Um, let me briefly go through this, the import. I told you standard or one-to-one. -one. There is something else, forget about minimal, but there is something new called embedded in Sidecar. For very few of you who have an art director over your shoulder, 
or who absolutely need to import as fast as possible. You're shooting sports and it's going out to a wire, right? Or I'll do shoots for Google, for instance, and I have a live team on the West Coast when I'm the East Coast shooting events and they're calling and sorting the images almost in real time as they import them. You know, using collections in Adobe Lightroom in the cloud um, to facilitate the process. The import needs to be fast, right? If the import needs to be fast, you can choose embedded in sidecar. What that means is when you take a picture, what happens on the back of your camera, if you're shooting raw, especially, raw is just binary code, just numbers. It's just zeros and ones. It looks like the matrix. We need to see a picture. So your camera is generating a preview already. So rather than having Lightroom generate a preview, you can use the camera's preview to drastically increase the speed of the import. Just know that that preview is roughly about the size of the screen of your camera, right? Two or three inches. That's not going to be very helpful in the long run. You're still going to want to generate those previews, but you can generate them later, right? But it is a one-way street. You can only do this at the time of import if you want to drastically speed up the import. So for most of you, I don't recommend this, but for those of you who really need the fastest import possible, this is a solution, right? This is why some people would go to third-party software just to cull through their images and then just import the ones that they like into Lightroom. Don't do that. It's just going to be a nightmare. You want everything in one place. But this is this may be a solution for some of you, not all of you. All right, uh, where are we? Full screen previews, smart previews. So smart previews, uh, they're 25, 40 pixels on the long end. And what that means is, let's say you want to work on the couch. You want to get away for the weekend, if it's safe to do so right now. And you don't want to carry that giant hard drive with you. Right? What you can do is go into these previews. I'll import these. And you can generate smart previews. You can generate an import, but you can generate them at any time too. Right? It's what I showed you guys before as well. You can go into the library and go to previews. And you can generate or you can discard smart previews. What that means is if you have this, I can just build this one or I can build all of them. If you have these previews generated, it saves enough information about that picture in your catalog so you don't have, your, you don't have to have your larger drive plugged in. Now, the, the speed increase of this, because that's not necessarily a speed increase. The speed increase is now you don't have that giant preview and you don't have that full resolution picture. You just have a picture that's 2,540 pixels on the long end, and that's what you're processing as well. This is going to increase the develop module. When you go to work on a picture, it's going to be a lot faster if you're working at developing on a smart preview rather than even the full resolution preview. Those of you that are working on slower computers or older computers especially. What we used to do is unplug that drive to force Lightroom to use smart previews. Now there's an option we can choose just to use smart previews. So this is another way that you can speed up the post-processing, the develop aspect of it. All right, uh, 10 more minutes left. So I'll try to rush through the rest of these. Um, smart previews, performance. We covered that. Um, there's a link to how to optimize performance that I can send you guys that link to. That's going to be up here under uh, 64 megabits and a few other places as well. Um, so you want to go to the, basically Adobe's website and I'll show you how to optimize the performance as well. Uh, stacking. So let me take you to some photos. I was talking to Derek about this before, before we went live and showing where we were yesterday. I basically drove up like the craziest, scariest road in the world. Um, and this is close by. This is an aerial shot that I took. So for a lot of you that may be shooting HDR or panos, you'll have the option to select them and then you can create control M will merge to a pano. Control H will merge to an HDR. But then you have to do that for all of your, all the images you have to merge. So now what we can do instead is control G, I'm sorry, command G. Command G will group them. So anytime you have a group of images like this, and you can tell that there's a group. And you can use thumbs up and thumbs down, whatever system you want to use. Anytime you have those, you can group them. And then you can batch all those groups to create panels, to create HDRs. And it will work in the background, which is drastically a time saver. The other thing you can do is, let's say you come across a group of images that you want to create a panel for. Instead of holding Control M, the reason why I'm showing that shortcut is you can right click and go to Photo Merge, but that's going to take forever. Right? Anything you do, you only want to have to do once. Instead of holding Control M, if I hold Shift Control M, that's just going to tell Lightroom do this in the background. Go to the next step, Shift Control M. Right? It'll work in the background, so on and so on. 
right? So you can drastically increase just from a approach perspective, how to make Lightroom work for you. Now, for those of you that are shooting HDR, right? These are a whole bunch of panos here. Uh, let's see. I shot this of my buddy Lawrence. If you guys don't know him, Lawrence Lederman. Um, he's doing an overlanding trip. He's out here with us right now. Um, it was his idea <laughs> to drive the craziest, scariest road ever. Uh, he'll be on Lightroom or uh, your platform, B&H, with Derek next week. Um, so this is an HDR bracketed pano. I shot that last night at sunset. Instead of building those HDRs, which I had to used to have to do, and then stack them into a to a pan out, I can click on the first one, click on that last one, again Control M, and Lightroom's going to say, "Wait a second, I'm recognizing HDRs and panos." You can do this all at once, right? This isn't a software or hardware thing. This is just a knowledge. This is a smart kind of thing. So now we can build those out, and the result would be ah, I'm going to cancel that. These are from the new Mavic Air 2, which is just an crazy. I'll hit F for full screen. And this is a stitched HDR panel. It's so dark that I could barely see. And this is from a, uh, from a two thirds inch sensor on the, on the Mavic Air 2. And the quality is just unbelievable. All right, so that's where we were last night. So just a little tip, right? Bracketed HDR panels, one click solution. So maybe you might, many of you may not know that that's possible. All right. Um, what else we got here? Full screen previews, performance, stacking, keywording. I don't have time to go into keywording. I did a whole, actually I did multiple classes on keywording. There's significant speed increases when it comes to how to organize and develop a workflow around the keywording process that I developed and building a hierarchy out. And the reason why you only want to do three or four keywords. Now, just speaking of keywording, by the way, all you need is these three keywords. Who, what, and where. People. This is actually a good opportunity to show you. This happens all the time because I work with a lot of students and they'll send me files. So their keywords get built into mine. You can batch, remove, or delete keywords that you don't want by selecting multiple ones and not right clicking and choosing delete because it will only do one at a time. But if you just hit this minus key, these are the only three keyword hierarchies that you need, who, what, and where. Everything will fall into that category, what and where. You don't need any more. There's a very, there's a lot of good reasons that I could show you. I don't have time to do that today. It's in the boot camp I'm doing next month. It's just, it's like the full picture, the entire ultimate workflow. Uh, but this is a drastic time saver when you understand that putting something, keywording at once, Empire State Building, instantly and automatically keywords it, Midtown, Manhattan, New York City, New York, United States, North America, all the way up the list just by doing one keyword, right? And then we can do synonyms to attach more to that. New York City instead of NYC, NY instead of New York, ESB instead of Empire State Building. All of those get applied with one click. So the whole system kind of takes shape for speed. Anything you do, you only have to do once. Okay, five more minutes, man. Gonna come through the home stretch here. Um, fewest number of keywords possible, as we talked about that. Word room, I will briefly show you this. So, Library, plugin extras, keywording. And this will be the last thing I say about keywording. It can be a tedious process, do the least amount of work possible. That's the fastest way to increase anything. Just do the least amount of work possible. We want to work smarter. That's why I call the smarts, not harder. That's my job to show you all these tricks. If you are a nut about keywording, if you're um, submitting to stock photography, or you need this to be you just all these keywords applied to it, there's something called word room. You can just Google it, you'll find it. It's a, a it's still like a, a free app, I believe. And what this will do is you can install it in Lightroom and this will recommend a whole bunch of keywords that you can apply up to like 64, I believe, at one click, right? Everything we're gonna do with just one click. The import, the post-processing, the export, all of it, one click. And I could apply all those with just one click if I wanted to. I don't recommend it for everybody, but for those of you that, that are like really jazzed by this, it's kind of a cool solution. All right, so I'll close that out. Um, that takes care of the culling. Developing post-processing. The one thing I will say is you can auto-adjust your pictures. So this is too dark. Let's say this, this is intentional. These are bracketed photos. Command U. 
that will instantly adjust your photos. And it's very intelligent. It's not just fixing your highlights and shadows. It's saying it's building a whole database around Adobe calls it Adobe Sensei. It's an AI algorithm. And it looks at how everyone in the Adobe platform edits their photos. And it says, hey, this is a similar picture. This is how everyone else has edited it. And it's an intelligent version of an auto adjustment. And then you can tweak it from there. And the cool thing is, if you build presets, and that's another tip I was gonna get to later on, if you like this adjustment, right? And you say, yeah, I want this to be a little bit warmer. And I like this look. All right, that's my original, that's my warmer. You can save that as a preset. I can go to presets. So anything you do, you only do once, right? That's the, that's works smarter. But there's something else that's pretty cool. I had a client in my last boot camp that said, can I auto adjust on import? And at first I was like, I don't think you can. I've never tried it and I've never seen it. And then I realized actually you can, but it's hidden. So let me leave you with this tip. Manage presets. If you come up over here, now these will be unchecked. They're under classic. But if you click classic general, this will give you the option to auto adjust your presets on import. So as long as I choose classic general, that will enable that preset or that set of presets under here, classic general. This isn't here by default, unfortunately, they took this away. Then I have auto settings as an option. So what that means is when I go to import a picture and upon import, I can apply develop um, presets, apply during import here. Now I have the option on a classic general to auto apply adjustments to batch without you doing anything at all. This is like a no click solution to auto adjust every file to get it to a working point so that you can tweak it from there. It's actually really impressive, but you have to know that secret handshake, right? So just under classic general, under auto settings, you have to enable that under manage presets, under presets. All right, uh, developing the rest, auto sync is another important one. So what I can do is if I wanna edit all these files at once, I have this option under sync here to click this, this little light switch, and that turns on auto sync. What that means is, if I look at, if I bring up my thumbnail view, if I make one black and white, I make all of them. Anything you do, you only have to do once. So if you're an event photographer, if you're a family photographer and everything is in the room is too orange or the lighting is wrong, you can batch select all of them and edit thousands of photos with one click, with the preset, or however you just adjust this one file. Every time I adjust this one file, adjust all the others instantly. Command U will auto adjust that back. So you only have to do things once. That's the power of Lightroom is that you can automate everything. And that's everything. This is just a small part of it. The whole workflow that I'm doing next month today, it's 14 hours of a boot camp back to back Saturday and Sunday. I'll see through every step and every ability that Lightroom allows us to do to leverage every aspect of it to take the least amount of time to get the most of work done and do it as efficiently as possible. Uh, if there's anything else, I know we're just, we only have like another minute or two left. Um, I can send you guys some of these links, so don't worry about it. Uh, just reach out to me, Clifford, cliffordpicket.com. Uh, the presets we pretty much talked about, so that covers that. From a sharing perspective, I'm not gonna cover that too much other than to say, you don't need to export your files anymore. Um, the best thing to do, shift command D is a, is a file. If you do, if you, if you find a reason to export, you can save all these settings by hitting add and save that as a preset, demo B and H. And you never need to do that again either, right? So if you export for email, you export for any reason, that will be under, when you go, right click and go to export, here's all the presets. You wanna create a preset for everything so you only have to do it once. The better way to share though is simply to create a collection, right? I can create a collection called Speed of Lightroom. Make sure I select the images and I can sync with Lightroom. When I do that, it's gonna create this own collection for me. I'll have this option to make public. When I click that button, it's gonna generate a URL and that's the URL that you use to share. This is gonna be such a, a, a time saver for a lot of you who are exporting images all the time. And the client gets back to you or friends that say, yeah, but can you adjust this? And then you have to find that one and then you have to re-export it and send it to them. Just send them a link. When they say, yeah, but I like these, but you know what? I don't like them black and can you make them color? Sure, reset. Now we just made them color. That gets updated on their end. They just have to refresh their page, All right? So it's a giant time saver for a lot of you that are delivering images, even just personally into friends and family, but also professionally to clients as well. 
And the last one, advanced multi-catalog workflow. I'm gonna reserve that um, for the bootcamp. Uh, it does take a little bit of time. It's a little bit of an advanced setup and it may not be applicable to everybody, but it is a drastic way to increase the performance as well, leveraging SSDs, the internal drive and your external drive. So that pretty much covers it up to the minute. I don't wanna to take too much time, Derek. I know we have someone else coming on after this. Um, I will say, if you guys have any questions, there's a lot that we covered. Again, I'm happy to send you guys a cliff notes. I'm happy to send you guys a link for this, for this mind map as well. This links out to Adobe's website where they have performance uh, recommendations. And just shoot me an email. I'm here to you know, be a resource for you guys. We've been doing this for a long time uh, with B&H, doing the Lightroom Live, so I'm sure we'll be doing more. But I'm here to help you guys. I, I, I wanna be the resource I wish I had when I got started. And so anything at all, reach out. Just cliff at cliffordpicker.com, reach out. And for those of you that are interested in the bootcamp, um, just go to my website. It's cliff, uh, cliffordpicket.com and you'll see under the workshops calendar I'll have uh, a link to the boot camp. That'll be uh, the fifth and sixth. There's a good deal on that. And there's some of the other workshops that we have coming up as well. So just reach out if you guys have any questions at all. Thank you for your time. And Derek, thank you for your time, man. Speed racer. Wow. That was probably one of the most efficient Lightroom webinars we've ever seen from you. That was you, <laughs> it's like zoned in. You know, we only had an hour. There's a lot to cover, so I had to stay focused. I didn't know if it was you were breathing in a little bit of that Colorado air out there, and it just kind of... Ah, man, I know. i got to be careful going this yeah. fast. It's a slower <laughs> pace at 10,000 feet, you know? <laughs> I know. Can we, Susan, if you're watching or listening, can we get that guy a ventilator? Oh, gonna... I know. They do sell canned air all over the place here. I'm like, why did I... Oh, now I know why. Okay. <laughs> well, we did get a nice comment in from Mark Goldberg. He said, as usual, you are amazing. I learn something new each time I watch, even though I've seen the same ones multiple times. He owes you many beers or sake. All right. Mark, tell me where you live, man. I'm going to follow <laughs> up on that. <laughs> he, he's bringing the RV over. Yeah, exactly. Careful what you wish for. Exactly. <laughs> now, Cliff, thank you so much, man. Um, for those of you who are wondering where he went, no, he didn't disappear. We, we brought him back. Um, he is, when are you coming back? When are you heading back this way? Um, we're not quite sure yet. We'll be back in October for the, a lot of these, boot, or a lot of the boot camps. For the, uh, the boot camps are virtual, but the workshops we're doing, we're still waiting to hear back from Nova Scotia uh, about getting in the country and doing this safely. We have a whole fall foliage tour planned, um, but we need to make sure. So on a, every three or four days, we're talking to the hotels and different administrators trying to figure out if, if we're going to do this and, and if we're going to do it, we're going to do it safely. If we don't do this, we're going to move a lot of the workshops off here to the West Coast. So stay tuned for that. Um, you guys are just, just go to my website. You'll see the update and you can sign up for the newsletter there or just reach out if you have questions. But man, I was so psyched for Nova Scotia and I go up there every year. I have good friends and family there and Acadia we go every year. South Africa, we still should be good. That'll be next year. Um, but we have a lot more, you know, workshops planned, but it is going to be flexible either on the East Coast or West Coast. So if that happens, we'll be back in October on the East Coast. And then we'll see. If it doesn't, we're, it'll probably be a little bit longer until I'm back on the East Coast. <laughs> so I'll have to drag all of you guys, East Coasters out here. I already, I already told you, you're more than welcome to come out here anytime. We got a I chair know. and a beer for you by the campfire. Maybe I'll just sneak out there and hope that no one realizes. I'll, I'll put up I'll put up a nice green screen backdrop. No one will know that I left the city. I already got a green screen in the RV. You know this. Hey, I can set you up. No one, no one will even know. We'll be right across from a table from each other, and no one will even know. Danny, Courtney, <laughs> do not say a word. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Cliff, thank you so much again, man. Next time, no I promise you all, we will bring Cliff back with more time to get to some of your questions. We, we know that you guys all love throwing a ton of questions at Cliff, more than we could ever possibly handle in an hour. But Cliff and I are working on getting him back in, bringing back more Lightroom programming and a different range. Um, as he mentioned earlier, we are gonna have Cliff and Susan Magnano back next week. And if Lawrence doesn't chill out with the uh, sliding down mountainsides and overlanding and <laughs> taking that Jeep all over to heck and back, uh, we'll have Lawrence next week as well. Yeah, we might be, be making a cameo and he might be making cameo as well. We'll, we'll see. We're going to find the coolest place to broadcast from that has a signal. Awesome. Yes, make sure there's a signal. I don't, I don't want to have to sit over here and try to have to spin my wheels trying to fill in for you guys. We got everything covered, man. We have about four or five of these little Wi-Fi hotspots. 
We're tethering yeah. from every device possible. We got all the apps to figure out where the towers are. Um, we'll find a good spot. Awesome. Well, look forward to it. As always, Cliff, thank you for joining us. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. This has been another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space.